rights, so the nature of proprietary interests in land, and also the uh, and also the types of interests that one can have over uh, over different areas uh, within land law. So let's have a look at how we can understand these pieces of legislation. The motivation for these two pieces of legislation, the rationale, the reason why we want to consolidate um, the law relating to um, land with the Land Registration Act was introduced two new systems for the conduct of conveyancing, the conduct of buying and selling um, property. So conveyancing is the law concerning uh, a conveyance or a transfer of property. And the two systems that was introduced in the uh, Land Registration Act were the system of registered title and also the system of unregistered title. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the land registration interests um, from, from, from the sort of status of being legal because before the Law of Property Act any legal interest in land was both equal and universal so it meant it applied to everybody. So if a third party was to have a legal interest in an estate, that interest would be universally and always binding to any purchaser, regardless of what the purchaser did. So when we're asking the question, if somebody wants to sell me a house for half a minute in more detail in the next lesson, and we're going to talk a little bit, you know, introduce the topics of, uh, of unregistered and registered title. But what we will do for the rest of this lesson is talk about how the Law of Property Act reclassified a number of different types of estates and interests in land. And so therefore we can split this into two different ways, uh, two different um, videos that we can use to understand, to better understand uh, the ways in which these pieces of legislation still remain very influential. Uh, fee simple absolute, but without having any kind of obligations to the beneficiaries being seen. Now the way this is done is something that we're going to talk about in a in a lesson when we talk about unregistered title, but uh, the the process of overreaching involves a number of procedural steps that will eventually allow a purchaser to take the property from the trust almost and replace the um, replace the the property with and this refers to uh, this allows sorry for a system whereby if one of these people were to pass away one of these four people to pass away, they cannot introduce new people into this legal estate by way of a settlement in, for example, a will. They cannot leave this in their will um, because there are other people who have interests within, uh, so they have legal interests within this estate. So this is one type of legal estate that can exist. And we will look at the concept before we actually go about um, going through this transaction. And these are questions that the 1925 legislation has to deal with. The first question is, how do I know that this individual really owns the estate? If they don't own it, then they have no right to sell it. And so they could just be trying to steal my money. So that is the first question that we need to ask if somebody is offering to sell you um, a property. The second question is, how do I know action should be taken to facilitate and cheapen the transfer of land? So we're talking about um, how we achieve the transferal of land from one party to another and how we make that process cheaper and um, by extension make that process more efficient. So this involved looking at uh, the process of purchasing a state in land and how we can do this more effectively. And this will again um, extend to reducing the if there are any other third party interests in this estate. Because if I have got third part, uh, legal third party interests in in a state, in, in the estate um, related, the, the estate, sorry, that uh, I want to purchase, then if that's the case, I could be bound to them. I could have, a, they could be binding onto me once I purchase the estate. And so it's important that we know what they are before um, we um, go about um, doing this transaction. Really be subordinated within this transaction. Because if you have uh, legitimate legal third party interests, in a particular estate, then the purchase of this, the conveyancing of this piece of land, of this property, um, should not uh, infringe on these legal uh, rights and these legal interests that a, a third party may have. 
So we have what we what we have is a, a complex web of issues that need to be resolved using freehold covenants, etc., 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 etc. And so we can really begin to delineate between third-party interests that are legal and therefore universally binding and third-party interests that are equitable where we might have rights um, to, um, we have, might have the right to not be bound um, to them. The one thing I want to finish off on is just a quick disclaimer about the issue of overreaching. Again, we talked about overreaching earlier on in these pieces of legislation. And this is what the legislation did to respond to these issues. So they took into consideration all the issues and the 1925 property legislation did a number of things to try and answer these questions. So the first thing they did within the Law of Property Act of 1925, they reclassified a number of different types of estates and interests in land. The second thing they did, beneficiaries B and C. How? Well, the concept of overreaching was introduced by the Law of Property Act 1925, and what it does is it allows for the purchase of property that is held in trust, like in this example, okay, but in such a way as to devolve their obligations in equity, as to get rid of their uh, obligations in equity. They can um, basically enjoy the uh, enjoy the their interests in the land as a in the land okay our individual rights will trump those of the equitable interests that exist and that's why it's important that the law of property act um, removed a bunch of third party proprietary interests in land uh, from the sort of the from the realm of the, the legal realm whereby they were universally binding and into the realm of equity whereby if we are um, if we meet the requirements of that um, this was a piece of legislation that has been updated and so when we talk about land registration and the land registration act we're mainly focusing on the land registration act of 2002 because that's when we see the most up-to-date reforms of this area of land law so these two pieces of legislation represent a very important aspect of land law they set out some fundamental rules relating to the nature of the parties uh, when it comes to interests in land. So, as we've already mentioned, um, that uh, it's already been mentioned that the legislation has uh, to better protect the facilitation uh, of of buying and selling property, the conveyancing. Okay. But we also have to be mindful of any other third party interests that exist on a particular estate. And the reason why we have to be mindful of these third party interests is because they ought not to read is the second kind of legal interest that somebody can have over a piece of land. Under section 1 subsection 2 of the Law of Property Act 1925, or it is stated that all other interests that can exist on uh, in the land uh, will be reduced to equitable interests. So. We, it, it defines the two legal interests that can exist within land and then it reduces the rest to that we talked about when we're talking about solutions that uh, solutions to a number of issues raised within the conveyancing of, of, of title um, is the reduction of legal interests because um, section 1 subsection 1b of the law of the property act describes um, the other kinds of estates that can exist in legal form and these are known as leasehold estates now we we'll talk again we'll talk about this in a separate lesson but uh, a leaseholder estate increase the demand and it will increase the supply of um, of these uh, of these transactions and so we can um, you know, better facilitate the uh, market in estates so what were the kind of questions that need to be asked and need to be answered by these pieces of legislation to really facilitate the efficient transfer of land, a cheap transfer of land, and also ensure you know a safe protection within the transfer of land, basically um, equitable and um, trusts in land um, that arise from from this relationship. But what this does do 
the this reduction is it does allow for the legal owner to not necessarily be bound to third party equitable interests depending of course if it meets the if they if the purchaser or the person who has the legal owner um, meets the particular requirements but an equitable interest is that while a legal interest is universally binding an equitable interest is is binding it would be binding onto everybody except for somebody who we would call the equities darling now this is an equities darling simply refers to an individual whose rights trump any kind of previous equitable interests so we can sort of quash uh, our obligations to an equitable interest you should note that these interests that are now equitable that doesn't necessarily mean that a legal owner can overreach them and the reason for that is overreaching can only be done by way of interest of beneficiaries under a trust. So it has to be done within the context of the trust. Now this of course can be done through an express trust or even a trust that is implied. And we are going to do a lesson on, on the relationship between um, trusts law and land law at a million pounds. And my question is, what are the third party interests that exist? If there are some third party interests that are we are unable to um, you know dissolve be um, dissolved from, there are some interests that are legal and therefore are binding to us universally, then my, that might discourage me from um, wanting to purchase the estate. So the difference between a legal interest if we are uh, if it has been determined that we are the equities darling. And this is something that is judicially determined. We're determined by the courts. But if, uh, and there are a number of requirements that are that are needed to um, determine whether or not somebody is an equities darling, something that we'll look at in a later lesson. But if you meet these requirements, if we meet the requirements uh, and we are designated or classified as the equities darling, we will not be bound to the specific equitable interest of land. Well, let's take an example. Suppose somebody offers to sell you a house for a particular price. Let's say they, they uh, it's an expensive part of, in the country and they say they offer to sell you this house for half a million pounds. Suppose also that you want to take this person up on their offer and you want to purchase the estate. You want to purchase this house for the price that is set. Well, there are a couple of questions that relate to um, how that should really be answered. And so really, the, the legislation ought to create a situation where this information is readily available before the transaction takes place. Because in doing so, that will mitigate risks, which is part of the mandate of these, um, these early pieces of, of legislation. These also concerns are, are the purchaser. So when we're talking about this, this question, one of the issues that we need to relate to is the issue of the rights of the, of the, the maximum of four and the issues of, of, of multiple people when we talk about um, co-ownership in, in, in its own separate lessons. What it also did was introduce a system known as overreaching. And this is something that relates to um, trusts in land. So before the introduction of property legislation, of this, this particular property legislation, a purchaser might be bound to obligations of the benefits of equitable interests. Now, um, this doesn't include every single kind of third party interest, which we'll talk about in a second, but it also reduces a, a, a vast majority of third party interests that are allowed to exist as legal interests. And it's important to know that there is a distinction between a legal interest in land and an equitable interest in land. And effectively, it's important that we um, remove a bunch of third party of an estate by way of equity. Now, what we mean by this is that suppose we have a scenario where there are uh, three individuals where the first person, A, has an estate in trust. They hold this estate within trust and the beneficiaries of the, of the trust are B and C, these two different people. Now, we have a system here where under common law, the rights of uh, A would have the Law of Property Act of 1925. We'll talk about the rationale for making a number of um, reforms, a number of questions that 
arise when we're talking about issues relating to conveyancing. And also talking about issues relating to the uh, purchase of land, the issues relating to third party interests in land, and then talk about how these issues and how these questions were answered by the law of property estate, and they refer to a fee simple uh, that uh, sorry a fee simple ownership whereby there are no limits on the owner's rights over this piece of uh, property over this land. And what's also important is they cleared up a number of issues relating to um, relates to the number of people that are allowed to hold legal estate at any one time. The maximum number is now four. And we have pieces of legislation that consolidated a number of reforms, and some of these pieces of legislation, specifically two, um, remain incredibly crucial to our understanding of land law today. The two that are most relevant today are the Law of Property Act 1925, which we will be looking at in this lesson, and then we also have the Land Registration Act of 1925, which is something we'll examine in the next lesson. Although you should note that while we have the Land Registration Act of 1925, extra costs that um, were added on top of the, the process of conveyancing before. Also within this motivation, within this mandate that we have, there is also the focus on the mitigation of risk within the transaction of the purchase of land. Because if we can reduce the potential risks in as far as we possibly can, this is going to have a great impact on the markets in estates. Okay, you'll be right over the estate under the common law, and then B and C would have rights in equity because it is held in trust, and they are the beneficiaries of that trust. Now, suppose that a purchaser comes along and wants to purchase this um, estate. Before 1925, before the 1925 Law of Property Act, uh, you can have, uh, if you are given notice uh, of the beneficial uh, interest in the estate, if you are given interest, the rights of uh, being able to, so has the rights to the interests in the estate as a fee simple absolute uh, in possession of this um, piece of land. And again, we will look at this more when we look at unregistered land. But this is an example of the kind of messy situations that existed before the Law of Property Act that the Law of Property Act was able to um, change and be able to fix and solve in a way. So one thing, and uh, we want to consolidate that into, uh, you know, into these pieces of legislation. Uh, there's a number of motivations. There are a number of motivations and questions and issues that arise when it comes to the the buying and selling of estates. And so therefore we have to, uh, and therefore this is what the, the motivation for this legislation was. So the committee charged with coming up with these reforms, the committee charged with, you know, developing this legislation, uh, it was given a mandate to quote, advise what, uh, sorry, given notice, sorry, of the beneficiaries B and C, you would be bound in equity by the interests of those beneficiaries. You'll be bound to um, be able, uh, so you'd only be able to enter this transaction as a trustee within the benefits of this state, and the benefits will still go to B and C. So there is no way in which we can sort of take the trust, the property out of the trust, as in, in a way. And this would cause a problem. Property Act 1925, what the Law of Property Act actually did to um, make it easier for the transferal of estates from a particular person to, to, to somebody else, the, the buying and selling of land. So the history of property legislation is quite interesting. Our understanding of land law today can really be traced back to this key moment in 1925 where a number of crucial reforms were made. Because if you are a purchaser who's been given notice of this uh, estate being held in trust, then no matter what you do, in the purchase and in the purchase of this estate, you will be bound to the um, bound to uh, the, the beneficiaries B and C who have equity interests in this land. They have equitable interests in this land. And this allowed for a system uh, to be reformed, and we have the overreaching, uh, the issue of overreaching. So what I'd like to do in this lesson is talk about property legislation.
specifically talk about the major reforms that were made to the system of land law following 1925. A number of pieces of legislation were made, talk about the changes before, uh, sorry, the, the situation before, and then the changes that these pieces of legislation impacted. So we'll talk a little bit about the history of property legislation, specific properties, darling. We can therefore, um, you know, we don't, we won't be bound to these equitable interests. So, with the law of property act reducing a number of third-party legal interests, what is it is doing is effectively removing the number of interests that a purchaser has to be bound by, and that will facilitate the the, the transaction, the conveyancing of, of land in a more in a more in a fairer way so let's talk about the reclassification of property interests so section one subsection one of the law of property act 1925 so the very start of this piece of legislation stated that it is that there are only uh, a certain number of legal estates that can exist the first of these is what's known as a fee simple absolute within possession or fee simple absolute in possession now these are a type of free third party legal interests the, the two major ones exist as easements and we also have mortgages these are two examples of third party um, interests that are not equitable but they are legal interests and then for the most part the rest of the uh, of third party interests can only exist in equity these include, um, but are not limited to, things like life estates, reversionary estates, estoppels, and because you might be discouraged from the purchase of property if you are bound to a number of third-party legal rights. If you are, if, if there are only equitable interests, and they are, uh, you know, and we are able to, um, and we are able to have rights that um, trump these equitable interests, then we're probably more likely to be able to um, purchase the property. And so, for the most part, there are only really two major legal interests in land that are... So, how can somebody effectively become a, a, a fee simple absolute over a piece of land, okay, without being bound to the equity interests of B and C? How can we, for example, take the uh, estate out of the trust almost, and we um, can then enjoy and have the rights to enjoy the land as a fee simple absolute. How can we do that without being bound to the equitable interests that have some kind of, um, something of particular value, often money. So, for those who exist within the context of this trust, the trust E and the beneficiaries, the estate will be taken out and replaced with something of particular value. And this will allow for the, uh, you know, a, a fair solution whereby the beneficiaries of the trust will get something in, ter in terms of value, or often it's money, and then the purchaser has 